I'm sorry to disappoint those of you who are interested in fashion, but the Taylor series that we're going to talk about today does not have anything to do with the series of models and uh, designs that a tailor might make. It actually refers to a fellow called Brooke Taylor, who was a mathematician and developed uh, the technique and uh, series expansions that we're going to look at today. So let's see, what is it that we're going to look at in this class? Well, so far we've constructed certain series based on special features, certain power series as well as certain series normally and we have sort of gone on a case-by-case -case situation for instance we notice that the uh, geometric series uh, which is the form uh, sum from 0 to infinity of some number r to the power n sums up to the expression 1 over 1 minus r well this was a very special case that turned out to be easy to prove and from it we have been able to show something about power series or in particular uh, the fact that any uh, function that looks like uh, 1 over 1 minus something, like in this one, 1 over 1 minus x squared, can be written as a power series by simply changing in the formula for the geometric uh, series, the r to x squared. And so we end up with the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the 2n. So this is, again, something that is quite nice, and uh, we have done other similar examples, but they're all sort of cooked up. I mean, they rely on some special conditions. What we're going to do uh, in this class is we're going to look at the question of whether there is a way to construct the power series for any given function. So if I start with a function that doesn't necessarily look nice and uh, nicely similar to a, the sum of a geometric series or to something else that we have seen before, can we actually construct a power series for it? Well, the answer is that yes, we can almost do it, uh, and, and where the almost refers not so much to the fact of whether we can do it, but to the fact that we can do it f almost for any given function. Well, of course, we also have the problem that we, uh, in order to do, to do this, we should be able to write down infinitely many terms, but that's a different story that goes without saying. It's part of the, uh, the magic of mathematics of being able to write infinitely many terms just with one symbol. Uh, the other question that we uh, can look at is, is it worth it? You know, so do, are we going to get some good uh, conclusions from this? And of course the answer is yes it is, otherwise we would not look at it. Uh, this being the last uh, class, the last topic of the course, of course we're not going to have time to develop this into anything further, but you will have a chance to see some more uses for these particular series in later courses. So let's see how that is done. In order to construct these, what we're going to call eventually the Taylor series, uh, we're going to use a method that in mathematics and in science in general uh, is used quite a bit. And the method is the following. First of all, let's start from a, a little bit of a limiting assumption, but really is not something that uh, is going to limit too much in the, for the kind of functions that we have been dealing with so far. Namely, let's assume that we have a function that has all derivatives at some number, at some value x equals c. And now what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have actually solved the problem. Okay, so we know how f of x is uh, written as a power series. So let's assume that this function has a power series and let's say that this is the power series. Of course I'm cheating because I'm just saying that the coefficients are an and I don't know what those an are. But that's exactly the issue. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have the solution and we're going to ask ourselves if we have the solution, what should it look like? So what should the coefficients a n be? Well, let's see. There is one coefficient that we can find fairly easily. How? Well, let's compute the function at c. Now notice that if I put x equals c, then all those powers all become zero, and all I'm left with is the first term, the one corresponding to n equals zero, which of course becomes just a zero. All right, so we've got one coefficient down, a of zero is just the value of the function at c, and infinitely many to go. Hmm, okay, well, let's not get discouraged. Now, let's see, we said that this function has all derivatives, and being a power function, we know how to compute the derivative of this function. All right, so let's look at f prime. f prime will be the sum from one to infinity. Remember, when we take the derivative, we lose the first term. Of what? Well, we're applying the power rule, so this becomes n times a to a n x minus c to the n minus one. And we're gonna play the same trick. We're gonna compute the derivative at c. Why? Because that's going to get rid of practically all of the terms except the first one, which this time corresponds to the value of n equal 1. So if n is equal to 1, 
the, the power of uh, C minus C simply does not exist, and we're left with just 1 times A1. So that tells us that F prime of C is going to be equal to A1. All right, so the first term A0 is the value of the function at C. The next uh, coefficient A1 is the value of the derivative at C. Hmm, could it be that these coefficients are just the values of the derivative at all these numbers? Well, let's not draw conclusions too hastily. After all, we've just checked the first two. Maybe this is just a coincidence for the first two terms and it's not going to continue. So, let's look at the later derivatives. So as we look at the second derivative, okay, we have to compute the derivative of the first derivative. Same idea. We now take the power rule, and we remember we had n a n. So now that gets multiplied by the n minus one, which was the new uh, exponent of the power. And of course, we have to give up the last, the first term again. So this time the series starts at two, and we're going to play the same game. Let's evaluate the second derivative at c. What do we get? Almost every term gets uh, disappears, it becomes zero, except for the one corresponding to n equal 2, in which case we're left with 2 times 1, okay, we don't need to write that down, times a2. So f double prime of c is going to be equal to 2a2, okay, well, we can still compute a2, that's going to be the second derivative of c divided by 2. Let's put that in our list. Hmm, so maybe we have to divide by what? By the order of the derivative? Well, that wouldn't fit with the a0. Well, let's compute another one. So let's compute the third derivative. So once again, we apply the power rule to the second derivative, drop the first term, which has now become a constant in the second derivative, and so we're left with the sum from 3 to infinity of something that looks like this. And then we're going to compute that third derivative at c. So what do we end up with? Well, we end up with 3, which is our n, times 2, which is n minus 1, times 1, which is n minus 2, times a3, and then everything else is gone. Okay, now we're starting to see the pattern, right? Because now a3 ends up being the third derivative of the function at c divided by 3 factorial. And if we put that into the list, notice that the pattern now becomes quite clear. Notice that uh, the, the first term, the a0, was the zeroth derivative. Uh, well, that's uh, what you may call the function, the zeroth derivative, we haven't done any derivatives, divided by 0 factorial, which is 1. And then the coefficient a1 is the first derivative divided by 1 factorial, which is 1. The second coefficient is uh, the second derivative divided by 2 factorial, which is 2, and then going on to 3 and so on. You may want to just compute a couple of more derivatives to convince yourself that the pattern continues, but in fact it does, and it turns out that the nth coefficient should be, remember we're just assuming that this power series exists and we're trying to figure out what do, should those a n look like. Well, if it exists, they should look like this, the nth derivative of the function at c divided by n factorial. Now, the question is, if we, in fact we construct a series like that, will it converge to the function? 